Morning, everyone. It is Monday, the 22nd day of May, one of my favorite months of the year. I'm doing one of my favorite things of our administration, which is Mental Health Monday. So welcome to a wonderful show of Mental Health Monday. I'm Mayor Chris Jensen of Noblesville, Indiana. I am here joined by a great friend of mine, incredible community advocate, just an all-around great person, Kristen Boyce, owner of Pathways to Healing Counseling. Good morning, Kristen. Good morning, Mayor Jensen. It's good to see you during this month of May. Yes, I love the month of May in Indiana. It's a lot of fun. I love the month of May all over the world, but Indiana is a lot of fun in particular. We we're just discussing. I hope you you and the boys crew had a wonderful weekend. It was very nice. It was lovely. Good. I love the sunshine. Yes, sunshine is good for everybody to get outside and move around. And we've talked about that before too. And if you are a local, hopefully you visited the Peony Festival in Noblesville. There was a lot of out-of-town visitors in our community, which is awesome. So, uh, but we're here today to talk a little bit about mental health, which has been a huge focus for our administration and our team. And uh, and Kristen has come alongside us for the last three, almost three and a half years now, as we have talked openly about this topic. And we have a great show today. We're going to talk about the topic of avoidance and what avoidance does in your family dynamics. And then we're going to dive into family dynamics and learn a little bit about them. And that may trigger a lot of people because everyone has a family and uh, there are certain dynamics around it all the time. So we're going to kind of dive in, peel that back. It's always a good conversation, Kristen, going into a long holiday weekend as folks may have cookouts from Memorial Day and whatnot that brings that family structure together, uh, which also just at times can add to uh, a complicated world that we live in. So we're going to dive into all that. But before we dive into anything, we're going to do what we love to do. And that is some square breathing. And Kristen, I'll let you walk us through that exercise. Fantastic. So if you are a parent, a grandparent, a friend, a family member of any kind, the number one most important key to a successful relationship is self-regulation. So we may not know that, and that that is the most important part of even success as a leader. So that's why learning to take deep breaths, reset and recenter is one of the most critical skills you can learn as a leader and a parent. So what we like to teach is square breathing. We start with our feet on the floor. So if you're standing or sitting, we're grounding into the nervous system, into our body. We're coming back to center. So if we flipped our lids, we're not in the past. We're not in the future. We are right here, right now. And the breath is a great catalyst to bring us back into the present moment. So we're going to inhale through our nose for four. We're going to hold for four. And the key here is a longer exhale out your mouth. You want to try to drag it out as long as possible. Why? Because the nervous system comes back into parasympathetic, which is kind of think of para as peace, a more peaceful state. And that's why I tell people five to 10 breaths, including my kids, but I have to be practicing it because they're watching. How am I regulated? How am I handling myself? So let's practice two breaths together. We're going to do a big, deep inhale through your nose, belly to the spine, hold and release out your mouth. You can probably just feel it in your own facial expressions where you might have had more of a tension in your jaw or maybe felt tight. You can feel that relaxation as you're taking the breath. And again, if you're not used to this, you may not feel that full benefit the first time. That's why you've got to practice this every hour. Let's do breath number two, pressing into your feet. Big, deep inhale through your nose. Hold and release. You're coming back into this moment right here and just notice the difference. And if we keep continuing on, you'll notice even a bigger difference. The more you practice this, the more benefit you're going to have through your whole family system. And it's one of the things we say in our family often. We're like, okay, I just need to take a deep breath. And me just saying that for myself models what it's like to reset. Instead of getting reactive, I can respond in a more appropriate way. Yeah, I always say, it, especially as a parent, it's one of the best things that you can do. And I have young, younger kids, younger than your girls, um, but we try to, you know, we've been working with our particular, our almost eight-year-old on Friday, Vivian will be eight, and then our six-year-old boy, 
um, you know, who kind of get just in typical eight and six year old moments where they freak out and scream and upset or, you know, Julie Jensen does such a phenomenal job of, you know, are you hurt or are you scared or are you frustrated, you know, trying to understand the, the basis because they all sound like they're being, um, you know, uh, chased by a bad guy in the moment. And a lot of times it's, they're just mad about something. So trying to dig through that, but then the, the breathing has been something that we, you know, they're not perfect at it. No kid is, but they're starting to at least think about that. And, and they can now kind of do it on command a little bit, know what we're talking about at least. So as a parent, it's a huge thing. I do it throughout the day. You can instantly like feel it wash over you. It slows me down for a minute. And I'm usually pretty high strung as you can probably tell. So I, I love the breathing. I love the breathing. So I, I love that exercise. It seems so simple, yet can be just really foundationally, you know, changing for you in a moment. So love it. Love the exercise. All right. Yeah, Let's... When they're teaching how to drive too. When they're Pardon learning, how, when they're learning how to oh, drive. I bet there's a lot of breathing going on. Clutch. No pun yes. intended for yeah. me. As I'm like, just breathe. Yeah. Just okay. breathe. Just breathe. You know, because kids are important to get in know, the car. I, before they yeah. get to the wheel. And Julie, Julie and I talk a lot about, you know, our, our attitudes or our mindset or our um, temperament totally set the foundation of our home. Then our kids react to us the same way we're reacting to them. And so it's not always perfect. It's never perfect, actually. But we're but the breathing does help. So love that. Um, all right. We're going to dive into a conversation that I'm intrigued about. Uh, it's something that I, I don't know. I'm not sure how much I relate to it. So I'm actually excited to learn more about it because I bet I relate to it a lot more than I think I do. And it's the topic of uh, the impact of avoidance on relationship. So the idea of avoiding, you know, I'll let you kind of define it, Kristen. Um, but I'm sure there are some people maybe sinking in their chair right this moment because they love to be avoiders. And I, you know, I get that. I am not an avoider, probably the opposite. My staff is probably laughing right now. I'm the opposite of avoidance. Um, but I bet you I, I relate to this more than I realize. So let's talk a little bit about the impact of avoidance on our relationships. Very good. I think the key to start with is research. So research shows the more a family system is avoidant, and I'll define that, the less they will feel connected in the in the family system and the more it negatively impacts mental health. And it's something more and more research is coming out about because if we don't talk about emotions and how we're feeling and what's going on, chances are we develop less self-awareness. And why is self-awareness so important? Because then we can manage what's going on in our nervous system, our emotions, and respond rather than react when we're triggered or activated. So what does avoidance mean? Avoidance means we want to, uh, we want to not go towards conflict, hard conversations, because maybe we want to have this perception that there's it keeps more peace in the family system and maybe we, we want to on the outside look like we're the happy family that have it all together and we're afraid if we bring the hard thing up that that's going to disrupt kind of the status quo of the family system and it's usually learned so it comes from generations of family systems that really are uncomfortable with conflict and maybe there is trauma in the family system and what do we avoid in family systems what kinds of things might we avoid addictions we might avoid talking about sex we might avoid talking about drugs and alcohol we might avoid talking about relationships in any kind of capacity how are you feeling what are some of the patterns we might avoid how we feel and we might stuff that down and not talk about our feelings because it isn't safe Perhaps the family feels threatened if someone's upset or has a different opinion. So we just kind of don't go there. And what happens in young children is they then not, they learn not to have a voice and be able to advocate for themselves. And I'm seeing this play out really in a massive way right now in children and teens. And we, I was talking about this with my kids over the weekend, that we haven't learned social skills in order to be able, and not across the board, but in general, in order to be handle the discomfort you feel by putting yourself out there and having a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So what I've seen is people will, and you'll see this, especially this has gone on for a long time, is in teens, they'll pull another party involved 
they'll talk to another friend, which is okay. And then all of a sudden they've talked to a whole group of friends. And now instead of going directly to the person they might have the issue with, we've kind of pulled in a group of people that's called triangulation. And what that does is that mirrors what we see in family dynamics. So oftentimes kids will bring in what they know into friendship circles into workplace situations because that's familiar to them that is a learned way they've to handle co conflict or when they're uncomfortable so why is this so important to learn to lean into that discomfort and have one-on-one -on -one conversations because this is a skill set that will transcend their relationships. So if they go on to have friendships, they go on to have work relationships or get married or be in a partnership, they know how to talk and work through hard things. But image can block us also from having those hard conversations because we don't want to look like we don't have it all together from the outside perspective. Well, I thought you hit on a funny thing. You, if you think of the word avoidance, you think that you don't want to talk about something at all. When in fact, it's maybe you don't want to talk about that hard topic with the person you need to talk about it with. And that then actually builds an even bigger problem because uh, you're actually just going to bring more and more people into the problem that you should be addressing directly with someone. And again, this sounds all great in theory. I'm sure I'm super guilty of this, this triangulation conversation all the time. I'm certain of it. But can you kind of dive a little bit deeper into the idea of triangulation and what that does? Maybe how does that impact the people you bring in to the triangle? So let's talk about it, how it relates to a family system. Yeah. This is really important. And then we can kind of feather that out in other yeah. situations. So let's say we have because I work with a variety of clients. Let's say we have a two daughters and a mother. OK, and a father. Let's say they're in a divorce situation. The mother then is upset with one of their older adult daughters, let's just say. And so they pull another daughter into the mix. They pull the sibling in and they're like, oh, why are, why is, you know, so-and-so Susie not talking to me? What, why do you think they're upset with me? I just don't understand what I've done. Instead of going directly to Susie, who you are concerned with, you've now pulled the daughter into the mix. And so what happens is the daughter then feels in the middle the daughter then feels like they've got to take a side. And this goes back to inner child work because it's a, it'll, it'll feel very young when someone does that. But then what do we learn to do? What is the family system learn to do moving forward, whether it's in a work situation or in a relationship? They learn to go to somebody else first rather than going to the person they have the issue with directly. Triangulation can be very unhealthy in the sense that it perpetuates uh, generational trauma. And what does that mean? It can feel like we're ganged up against. It can feel like, I don't know why you're upset with me, but I can feel this dynamic going on in the family system that nobody's talking about, but I know you're mad at me. I know you're upset with me. Why won't you just tell me? And then and not only say, why, and I know that you're mad at me, but I can also now tell that my brother Jim knows why you're mad at me. And now I'm really ticked off because Jim knows and you know, but I don't even know. And I'm the one that you're mad at. Yeah. And now I'm going to make up a story about yeah. why I think you're mad. So I'm going to make up a theory like, oh, you're mad at me because I didn't want to pick up your text. I didn't respond to your text. And now you're upset with me. Well, I don't really know if that's true. I'm kind of making that up because you won't tell me what's going on. So then we start making up stories in order to feel safe. We, the brain loves to have certainty. The brain loves to know what's going on so we can know what to do next. So story making then becomes a big part of how you function in life. So if someone, someone looks at you weird, now I'm going to be like, well, they're just, they're looking at me weird because they're mad at me because of something I did and I don't even know what I did. So that's how it recreates itself. And even in relationships, you can think your partner's mad at you and you're like, I know they're mad at me. And we're, but we haven't really asked them, are you upset with me? And maybe the partner avoids because of their family dynamic. And they're like, I don't want them to be mad at me. So I'm going to say everything's fine, which we know feelings inside. inside not expressed. Because we learned that in the family system, it wasn't safe to really talk about it because the other person's going to get mad at us. When we start doing our own work, we learn that it's okay if they're mad at us. I can handle it and I'm enough. It doesn't mean I'm a bad person. 
I can tolerate it. What happens is we have a low window of tolerance for any kind of conflict. And what we teach our kids is to avoid, because of our discomfort, those conversations in other relationships. And you'll see it play out. I'm watching it with many, many people play out, including me at times, right? When I don't go directly to somebody and I'm so upset and I'm so upset by this other person and I don't go ask them, are you upset with me? If so, can you help me understand what happened? What, what's going on? What, what are you upset about? We haven't learned the skill of going directly to somebody. And it's the most important skill I can teach family systems. So in our house, we have a very, what we call open system. And I'm sure this will come back to me at some point because I'm a therapist. So like my mom wanted to talk about everything. So we can swing the pendulum. But what we say is I'll say, is something bothering you? I can, it seems like there might be something going on. Do you want to talk about it? So we're creating a safe space. Now I can't go into fix it mode and give advice on everything I think they should be doing to fix why they're upset. I just need to hold the space. Mm -hmm. If they want me to give them a solution, they will ask, do you have ideas? And then we can brainstorm. But we don't want to go into fix it mode when we have someone tell us how they feel. So let's say we get to the point where we're going, okay, we're going to go more directly to the person. Now we're listening, mirroring. What is mirroring back? I'm going to kind of mirror back, paraphrase back what I heard the person say to see if I got it right. Because oftentimes it filters through my story that I've already created and I'm convinced that's true. And this happens all the time in couples where I'll have them mirror back what they heard. And it's not at all what they said. And so I check it. Did I get that after I mirror back? And then I'm going to offer empathy and say, oh, that makes sense how you feel. It doesn't mean I have to agree with it. So we really need to be teaching kids at a very young age communication skills and that it's okay to bring up hard conversations. It's okay to question things. So if they're like, well, why are you doing that? Why are, why do we do, you know, why do we have to, as a family, get up and then do our chores. You know, that's okay. Let them question it. And you can explain it and then say, how do you feel about it? Well, I don't want to. Okay. Sometimes we have to do these hard things we don't want to do. Let's take 10 deep breaths. Let's get it done. Let's knock it out and move on. We want to be a process oriented family system. What do I mean by process oriented? I mean, we can question things. We can lead with curiosity about each other and about myself. I can feel my feelings without someone getting upset. Now, if I'm taking my feelings out onto somebody else, that has to be managed. That's not what I'm saying. We are self-regulated and it's okay to have a variety of opinions and emotions in the family system. We can talk about them. We can name them. We can identify where they lie in our bodies because a lot of times we disconnect from our bodies. That takes time because we didn't learn that. And that's okay. We're going to fumble and bumble. At least we're leaning into conversations about many different topics, talking about alcohol use, talking about growing up. Was alcohol a central part of your family system? Talking about how food was used. You know, do we go to food for comfort? How Talking about our bodies and body image. We tend to shy away from those things. Um, sex, we talk about, you know, we, do, ooh, we don't want to talk about anything about related to sex, including with our partners, money, finances. People think the finances are the root of the issue. It's not. The, that's a symptom of a deeper issue. And we've got to peel back the layers of why are you avoidant? Why are you avoidant? W let's dive into why you feel so adverse to going towards some of these harder conversations because you're going to teach your kids to do the same thing. Yeah. So if you, I have like three things I want to ask about. One, uh, first of all, I've heard to say at the very beginning, if you have any questions during the show, feel free to type them in the chat. Happy to dive in and try to take them here. If not, we'll get them to you later. Or if you just want to say hi, let us know you're watching. That's great too. But please feel free. The chat is open and happy to take that feedback. Um, second thing I was going to ask about, you know, one thing that I have struggled with at times is um, just the fix it mentality, especially in my marriage with Julie. Uh, at times, I I think we struggle and I personally struggle of just letting people sometimes be upset about something and to let that sit for a little bit. They're allowed to feel that where I want to, if it's identified, 
I want to not only apologize if I'm wrong, which is probably like 90% of the time, and then, uh, but then fix it instantly. And then I want it flipped back instantly to that great Facebook family that we all are. Um, and there's definitely nothing between the, you know, below the surface. It's all great. Um, so I think I want to touch on that. And then I was going to ask about the triangulation. Is there ever a time um, within triangulation that that it might be okay to use? I mean, I do, do some people really use that as a gossiping kind of factor? Or is, it, is there ever a chance that folks just want to like check like, hey, I'm upset about this. Am I right to be upset about it and check it with someone else? Does that make sense at all? Um, and you can tackle any of those two, any of those comments there in any, in any given order. Okay. So let's go towards this last one just because it's more fresh, I think, yep. in terms of the question. So if you want to go to someone else and say, am I right to feel this way? You're triangulating. Yeah. I figure that's an excuse, right? It's, it's, it's something cause you're trying to ease your, yeah. you want acknowledgement. You want to be understood. Yeah. You're trying to ease. I'm not saying it's all good or bad, right or wrong. Cause that's a dangerous place. Sure. I swim in the gray. Mm -hmm. So there may be instances where that's appropriate. For example, if you need assistance with a mental health issue, you need to seek outside support systems. That's okay. If you need to seek a therapist, you need to seek 12 step program and you need help and you need to process because you're maybe projecting some of your own stuff, that is understandable. So I don't want to make it so black and white. The other piece of this is if you want to go to somebody else, ask yourself, what am I looking for from that other person? Am I looking for, and I'm not saying you're not going to do this with maybe a best friend that you have this vulnerable relationship with. You do need some people in your life that are support systems to you. When it becomes maladaptive in family systems, especially, is you are backdooring an essential conversation that will manifest itself at some point. If you're trying to do an intervention, for example, that's a different conversation that's more applicable to somebody that may be struggling with an, a serious addiction and you need some support services in order to help that person. If you're in denial and you're rationalizing, minimizing, that those are red flags. Those are red flags to say, why am I minimizing? Because I don't want to face the truth of what's going on. That's an individual work to be done that needs to be addressed to break the triangulation pattern. It is a, a really important deep dive because triangulation looks normal for a lot of people. It looks normal. It looks like I, I, me pulling in my aunt, my uncle, my sibling, my other kids, is just how we've always done it. And I don't see the harm. There's great harm because it People will feel like you're going behind their back and it creates distrust. And then a person doesn't learn how to go directly to the person they have the issue with. And that's, it can manifest in so many things. And I don't want to say exactly how it can, but I do want to say for a couple of reasons, affairs, um, because we're not going directly to our partner. We go outside to somebody else and we find comfort in that. That is serious. So that's why this is so important. And then the second piece on wanting to work through it and fix it, I just want to say, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. It does because we want to feel better. We want it resolved. And we want to know we are owning our stuff. We're working through it. We're getting to the other side. This has been a big stretch for me and many others is learning that my timing may not be the same as someone else's timing my partner's timing. And I'm one that wants to jump in and resolve it. And they're not ready. And I have to say something like, when you're ready, I'm available. And then I'm going to take my deep breaths and soothe myself through that. And I think we have to acknowledge that, you know, just because you apologize, or you go straight to it, you've at least done your work to lay the groundwork for them to think through and understand, but it, you can't expect it to be instantaneous. Exactly. And it can be uncomfortable, mm -hmm. um, especially with teens and, and kids, too. They want to fe feel better. And then if the other friend perhaps isn't ready to work it out, that's really hard to sit in. It's yeah. really hard to sit in when they've said, I'm sorry, what else can I do to repair it? And they're like, I don't know. And so then you're like, OK, I've done what I can do. I've taken responsibility for my part. Now I have to sit in that discomfort of someone 
not being in that same place you are. And that's tough. Yeah, that is tough. And so with the remaining time we have here, I want to talk about because I'm sure there are a lot of parents here that are probably going to work on themselves. You know, they're thinking through triangulation, myself included, what that looks like in my life. How do I, you know, and I think every day I'm trying to be the best parent I can be to set my kids up to be the best parents they can be and trickle down, down the way. But if you see your kids in a triangulation conversation, now, whether it be you being involved or you're just seeing them with their friends, you know, and, and we all see it and we all have kids of different ages where they're talking to Susie because they're not all mad at Sally. You know what I mean? They're ganging up and, you know, nothing's worse than three eight year old girls, man. Boom. It, it's real. So, you know, how do we talk to our kids in a, in a very simplistic way to help them understand this? I mean, besides modeling, we know that's the best, always the best. But how do we talk to our kids? This is so true. And I want to say that it's one of the, cause your stuff can get activated if your kid's on the back end of it and they're the gang up one, like they're being ganged up on or they're on the other side of it. So first of all, I've got to check my own stuff. So that's first, cause that's real. Second is I have had this happen many times in our family. So we've walked through this even recently. And I think the key to this is let them process with you how they feel and now we even kind of role play. How can they have a conversation with this individual or with the group? And so we go directly to them and then I'll role play. So I'll say, you be them, I'll be you. Let's reverse it. I'll be you, you be them. And so what happens is they get, gain some confidence because it's scary. They're, people are afraid of rejection, abandonment, to be left out, to be shunned. To That is so scary. And so that is what they're afraid of. And so acknowledge that. And then we're going to role play. And if they say, well, what if they just still are mean to me? And I said, that's a possibility. How are you going to handle that? How are you going to nurture yourself through that? So role play, role play the conversation. Start with, I feel sad because I'm not sure what I've done. Can you help me understand what's, what's going on? Are you upset with me? Ask direct questions. Ask for examples. And this is dangerous with couples. I'm saying this specifically for friendship issues um, because then the kids can start to understand their brains aren't fully developed. So they will abstract talk like you always don't talk to me at lunch. OK, well, I feel like I am talking to you at lunch. So help me understand what that looks like when I'm not talking. What? Give me an example of when I don't talk to you at lunch because their brains need examples in order for them to create understanding. And then we say, okay, what can we do to move forward to heal this? And a lot of times they might not know, they can go to the, the school counselor. That's also a resource if they need help. The key here is empowering them to go directly to the person, as scary it is, as it is. That's our most important lesson we can teach. Now we start with some communication skills, start with I feel, do not use always, never, or but. <laughs> strike that from the conversation. And then when they get home, they're going to need to process what happened. Mm -hmm. So, and I've had kids call up and you're going to call the person up and say, Hey, can we talk? Not a texting. This is, yeah. this is what we're not going to work it out over text. I love that. Well, like I said, I, I just wanted, as a parent, you know, wanted to take a second to give some tools. And again, this is probably this half an hour flew by because it's, it's such a very topical, very real conversation that we all are not immune to. So, um, and again, I just, I love the conversation about how to sit in it, how to get through those awkward moments. Um, again, I, and I, the triangulation piece, I told you, I probably triangulate quite a bit, even though I don't usually avoid, I don't usually avoid tough conversations, but um, that doesn't mean I don't triangulate prior to those tough conversations, which isn't great either. So I love it. So Kristen Boyce, once again, nailing the topic per usual. Um, real quick, first of all, next month, we're going to talk about addiction. And I think we have a special guest from our, our friends down at Fairbanks who are just a amazing resource in central Indiana around addiction services. So I cannot wait for that conversation because there is, we've talked openly on the show about that. That is the root of a lot of challenges in our society right now. So looking forward to that. But if, if I'm struggling with a mental health challenge right now, if I know someone that's, that's struggling. If I wanted to tune in and Hey, like, you know, I I'm on a, I'm on my wits end. Where can I turn right now? First thing is if you need help, 988. The new 911 for mental health, 988. They have trained clinicians on the other end that can help you. And this is what I've taught my kids too. You can text or call 988 if you ever need anything mental health wise. If you're suicidal, having any suicidal thoughts, thought I don't want to be here, 
or anything else that you're struggling with that needs more intensive work, I highly recommend therapy. If you, if there's lots of programs around that are low cost or free. So Indiana Wesleyan has a program. Um, we're looking at CTS. They have a program. Any graduate school that has a counseling clinic offers free to no cost therapy. So there are resources out there for those that need assistance. Please know you're worth it. It will change generations, not only for you, but it will trickle down to the family system and there's no better investment. So put the Starbucks aside and invest in your mental health. It's amazing. Awesome. Well, in the meantime, keep breathing and we'll see you back here next month. Again, Kristen Boyce, thanks a million. Appreciate you. Thank you.